On the shores of the Ionian Sea is an island called Scorpius. This island and everything on it once belonged to a very rich man. One day, he told the island's priest to prepare his chapel for an unexpected wedding. The five-year widowhood of Jacqueline Kennedy is about to end in a way that's caught the whole world by surprise. We look at the two people whose private lives have been public property for so long. The news made headlines everywhere. The world's press came to Scorpius and kept on coming. They had been tipped off that Jackie Kennedy was on the yacht Christina. The crew fended them off, but the paparazzi wanted pictures. I was alone standing on the deck of Christine, and the first person who appeared was the bride herself. So I said, uh, Mrs. Jackie, does this remind you of the Spanish Armada? <laughs> the woman who was married to the most powerful statesman in the world has now chosen to marry one of the richest men in the world. Mrs. Jacqueline Kennedy, America's fairy tale princess was about to become Jackie O, wife of the shipping tycoon Aristotle Onassis. One headline screamed, Jackie, why? When Onassis announced that he was marrying Jackie, there was great disappointment by the great American public saying she's marrying the beauty and the beast and all those cliches. Um, as far as I'm concerned, Onassis never hid the fact that he liked to obtain expensive objects. He had Fabergés, he had yachts, planes, he, he bought divas. Why not the, the most famous widow in the world? Her reputation took a knock. Some said she married for money. Some said he married her to buy himself much needed respectability. in Paris. I believe you know the, the island where they have their little summer place with 200 servants. I know Nazis uh, many, many years. What sort of man is he? How would you describe him? He's a pirate. A pirate? A pirate. I see. Yes, of course. 26 years later, Konstantin Haritakis pays a visit to Onassis's favorite sister, Kaliroy. She tells him she's feeling upset about Jackie, who passed away the day before. They both feel hurt by the way the press covered Jackie's death. Constantine cannot understand how the many obituaries and tributes to Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis could have all but ignored the man she married. It was impossible after meeting Onassis, Aristo, not to fall in love with him. I love that man. So I, love I caress his photograph, says Caleroy. All the women were falling in love. He was not a handsome man. He was rather short. But he had wonderful eyes. And you could see in his eyes all the warmth of his uh, soul. The artist. The artist. Nineteen years later, both bride and groom are dead. Aristotle Socrates Onassis was born probably in 1906, and not in Greece, but in Turkey. His father was a tobacco trader who became head of the stock exchange in Smyrna. My father was a rather wealthy man, successful as a second generation. We were doing very well, but the First World War, 
finished up with all that. Half of the family was slaughtered. In 1922, the Turks began a ruthless ethnic cleansing. The Greeks who had lived in Asia Minor since the age of Homer were driven from their villages. The government announced that it was no longer a capital offense to kill a Christian. Hot on their heels came the Turkish army. When the army entered Smyrna, it put the city to sword and fire. As the Onassis family fled in small boats, a Turkish soldier tried to drag away his sister and a much-loved cousin disappeared. The horror of Smyrna. A young boy in a small boat, in uh, seeing the slaughter, seeing this uh, horror uh, around him. And I think that this was really the fact who changed the whole life of Onassis. The Onassis family in Smyrna suddenly met with a disaster. The, uh, uh, his uncle, Alexander, uh, was uh, uh, hanged by the Turks. When they uh, reached Greece, uh, they were uh, paupers. They lost all their money. No longer a rich man's son, Onassis found himself on the breadline. I had just finished the high school, and I was going to come to Oxford. Instead of going to Oxford, I had everything prepared, clothes and so on. I found myself in steerage immigrating to the Argentine. Onassis disembarked with barely a hundred dollars in his pocket. Over the next few years, he was going to do rather well in Buenos Aires. He reached Argentina together with his cousin, Nicolas Cornelidis. Uh, they were extremely poor at the time. They had to share the same room, uh, one bed. Uh, one uh, had to work in the daytime, and the other had to work in the nighttime because uh, they couldn't stay together in that little room in the same bed and sleep together. So Onassis has chosen to work night shifts in a telephone company. Working nights allowed Onassis to spend his days at a fancy yacht club, meeting the right people. There wasn't much work on the midnight shift, so Onassis practiced his foreign languages by listening in on international phone conversations. And this was how he spotted his first big business opportunity. In Argentina, as elsewhere, women were swooning over the smoldering good looks of a film star called Rudolf Valentino. Valentino's hit movies, The Sheik, and its sequel, The Son of the Sheik, had caused a mania for everything to do with the exotic Middle East. Onassis found a way to cash in on the craze. What gave him the idea was Valentino's way with a cigarette. So Onassis created his own brand of cigarette. He imported Turkish tobacco and targeted the female market. He began to meet with success. And that is the source of his first money. And it's not a coincidence that he has uh, chosen tobacco as the commodity to trade in. His father worked in this field. By his mid-twenties, Onassis had made his first million. Onassis started on the tobacco business, as you know, and uh, then uh, having the intuition towards shipping as a Greek, he turned to the shipping business. Greeks, uh, since uh, many thousand years ago, they were attached with the sea and attracted by the sea. So there is a long history between the Greeks and the sea. In the 1800s, the Greeks had only wooden boats for island trading. Today, they have the biggest merchant navy in the world. 
In the 1890s, they began to buy rusty old British tramp steamers. They crewed them with sons and nephews, worked them hard, and made money. Soon, tiny island communities spawned dozens of millionaires. Onassis was obsessed with the desire to be a ship owner. Uh, Onassis was a practical man, and he knew that if he wanted to uh, be in the shipping business, he had to learn, and he was not ashamed of learning. Up until his death, he wanted to learn. London was and is the most important shipping centre in the world. For hundreds of years, much of the city's wealth has come from brokering, chartering, shipping, and shipping insurance. Onassis had already made enough money to maintain a permanent suite at the Savoy. But now he was about to start all over again. He worked grueling hours in a small backroom shipping office. He learned how to risk his money in a risky business, one where almost daily freight rates soar and plunge on the trading floor of the Baltic Exchange. I'm a Greek ship owner, and my father was a Greek ship owner. Do you have to know, it's just like poker, when to get out and when to go in? And, you know, shipping is a tremendously gambling thing. It's timing. You cannot be afraid to lose. If you're afraid to lose, you can't make money because the ship gets old. Onassis was ambitious and never lacked nerve. Funny enough, all these ship owners are aggressive like that, but not too aggressive because the too aggressive people make one or two good decisions and then they go broke. In the years of depression, he was told that there were a couple of ships laid up and he could buy them for a song at the time. Of course, nobody knew what he was going to do with the ships. And I suspect that he did not know either. <laughs> so he risked his money, he bought the ships. Ten Canadian cargo ships were going cheap. Onassis bargained hard, paid cash, and bought six with his own money. With world shipping in the doldrums, he was taking a serious risk. But he had timed it right. The world depression eased, and before long, he was getting a handsome return on his investment. The proud young ship owner could well afford a state cabin on the liner Augustus, bound from Buenos Aires to Genoa. On board, he noticed an attractive older woman. She was a sophisticated divorcee called Ingeborg Dedichen. Before long, a shipboard romance blossomed. In all his serious love affairs, Onassis was attracted to strong, independent women. Throughout the 30s, he and Inge traveled everywhere together. The wealthy daughter of a Scandinavian shipping magnate, she opened doors for him. In 1938, a Swedish shipyard launched the Ariston. She was the first ship Onassis had built. Onassis was a man who could foresee a lot of things, and uh, he was always looking ahead of his times. He was the first one who started building larger and larger tankers, because he believed that the larger the tanker is, the more economical it is. Ariston means best in Greek. At 15,000 tons, she was also the biggest tanker afloat. Onassis, who saw that oil was the fuel of the future, ordered two more like her. The Ariston's maiden voyage was cause for celebration. A party of friends joined the ship. She was the first tanker to have a swimming pool. But the Second World War caught Onassis by surprise. In April 1940, an invasion fleet sailed from Germany. The Nazi war machine rolled over Denmark and Norway.
Anxious to avoid the same fate, Sweden declared itself neutral and impounded the ships of combatant nations. Onassis's three new ships were moored in Swedish docks for the rest of the war. Onassis may not have had a good war, but he had a good time. In Hollywood and New York, he mixed pleasure with business. He relaxed with Stavros Niakos, a fellow self-made Greek millionaire who shared his love of ships and women. Onassis said, I approach every woman as a potential mistress. If you walked into a room and you didn't know who he was, you'd still pay attention to him. And I noticed that because a lot of people look like Onassis in Greece. Half the population looks like Onassis. He was short, ugly, but he, you know, he had far more presence than, than a lot of uh, far, far better looking men than, I, than I've met. He, he wasn't awed by women. And of course, he was extremely generous. And the moment a woman would uh, express any desire, he'd say, well, you can have it, like that. So it was easy. And I mean, he, he got, after all, some pretty, pretty famous women. And he knew how to handle them very well and flatter them. He was a great flatterer. Onassis did not want a movie star for a wife, but a Greek girl from a good family. Tina and Eugenie Livanos were the daughters of a great shipping magnet and highly marriageable. I don't say that he married Tina because she was a girl of a rich family. But it's very interesting to notice that the marriage of two fortunes makes a bigger fortune. He was 40 when he married Tina. By way of a dowry, his father-in-law gave him a ship. But Onassis had earned his place at the top table. Despite German U-boats, he made money in the war. A ship chartered to the Allies earned a quarter of a million dollars a year. 450 Greek merchant ships took part in the war. 360 were sunk. Only Onassis never lost a ship or a sailor. But would his luck hold when the war was over? It wasn't as easy to make money after World War II as people suppose. The reason why a lot of people made money was because they took tremendous chances because they knew they were visionaries. They knew that America had to rebuild the world. How do you rebuild the world? Not by train, but by ship. At the end of the war, non-US citizens were forbidden to buy American liberty ships. But with a clever lawyer and a dummy corporation, Onassis snapped up 16 liberty ships and four surplus tankers. In the winter fuel crisis of 1947, his ready-made fleet made big money. Well, of course, Onassis was not a saint. Onassis would look into the deals, uh, find out whether there are loopholes, take his chances and go ahead. But he would never violate the law. He would be at the brink of the law. He would perform the law in his own way. In the shipyards of post-war Germany, Onassis saw his chance for a bigger and even bolder gamble. Well, then he visited Germany and he saw that it was wiped out. Nothing was there and he asked them whether they could build for him some ships, particular tankers. And they said that they cannot because they lacked finances. But if they had a contract for about 30 ships, uh, that, then they would go to the banks and get the money and build the yard and then build the ships. And this is exactly what he did. And he signed a contract for 30, if I remember correctly, 30 ships, 30 tankers. He started building tankers, which were called in those days monster tankers, which were about 46,000 tons, which today is a handy, handy size. Festtag im Hamburger Hafen. 50.000 Menschen kamen zu den Howaldswerken und sahen den Stapellauf des größten Tankers der Welt, der Tina Onassis. He named this monster tanker after his wife. His daughter Christina broke the champagne and his son Alexander pressed the button that sent her down the slipway. Die Taufe des stählernen Giganten. 
The super tanker's tonnage broke records, and the way Onassis financed them broke new ground too. He went to uh, an oil company first and secured a contract for, let's say, five years. He then went and ordered a ship. The only thing he didn't bother to tell the oil company was that he, hadn't, he didn't have the ship ready. Banks would not lend much money at the time for shipping and tankers and so forth. And he convinced them, after much, much uh, persuasion, that the proper thing to do was to finance not the ship, but the contract. Stavros Niarchos was becoming his great rival. Every time Onassis added a giant tanker to his fleet, Niarchos would go one better with an even bigger ship. He's a 47,000 ton oil tanker christened Spiros Niarchos after the eight month old son of Mr. Spiros Niarchos, the Greek controller of the greatest ever tanker fleet. Grandeur is a 39,000 ton capacity tanker, and with two more like it, which are launched later, it increases the fleet of the Hellene Magnet to 29 ships. Named the Virginia Niarchos, the turbine driven tanker over 47,000 tons dead weight is the sister ship of the Spiros Niarchos, still the world's largest single purpose oil tanker. Ironically, Stavros Niarchos had married Tina's sister, Eugenie, so the great rivals were brothers in law. Uh, Onassis and Niarchos did have a rivalry, and it was a normal one. They were both the two biggest ship owners among the Greeks. They both had about the same amount of ships and the same amount of wealth. There was a certain uh, competition there, of course there was, and there was a rivalry, and maybe even there was uh, some animosity. In fact, there was. In 1953, Onassis set up home in the south of France, where he leased an elegant chateau. Here, he and Tina enjoyed the good life. He had been poor and he was now rich. He saw, you know, what small amounts of money, what pleasure it could give to people who didn't have it. As a young journalist, Alan Bryan spent two weeks as a guest in the chateau. He had a big dinner and we had uh, uh, first thing was caviar, which needless to say I'd never had. Uh, and I tasted that. Absolutely wonderful. So I ate what was put on my plate, and he was talking away at the top, and stopped and said, Mr. Brian, he said, well, how do you like your caviar? Have you had it before? And I said, no. And he said, what do you think? And I said, I think it's the greatest thing in the world. And bring him more, more caviar. And came in great spoonfuls, each, I should suppose, about, you know, 50 quids worth, put in the thing. So I ate away at that and drank the vodka. And then he said, again, said, how's the caviar? Are you still liking the caviar? And I said, yes. He said, uh, how much more do you think you could eat, Mr. Brian? And I said, all you've got. And he said, bring him a bowl. He said, and a huge silver bowl came in like this. And for the rest of the evening, I didn't eat anything else of the food. I just drank the vodka and went to, ate this caviar. Little bits of it kind of spotting over me, you know. And I think I even flicked a bit occasionally at sort of passing people. Anyway, he was tremendously pleased with that, you see. It, and pointed out to everybody, here is this man really enjoying his food and his caviar. Well, no, never come across a, another millionaire. Think of Howard Hughes and all these people locked away and terrified of any human contact. He was down there, you know, he knew what it was like. By now, Onassis had bought up much of Monte Carlo. Olympic Maritime's headquarters were in an office over the casino. Tax-free Monaco made sense to a man whose ships had been among the first to fly flags of convenience from Panama and Liberia. From his office, Onassis could look down on the harbor, where his newly finished two and a half million dollar yacht lay at anchor. That's his yacht, Christina, down in the harbor. It was a Canadian frigate before Mr. Onassis converted it into somewhere to live. It flies a Liberian flag, although Mr. Onassis has never been there. He loved the yacht. He considered that it was his private house. He, he loved it so much that you could see him sometimes walking and having his hand on the, on the balustrade and caressing the, the, the varnish and everything else. You could see that in, when he was doing it. 
Dapper's egg is the bottom of a swimming pool when lowered. It's a dance floor when raised. The staircase with marble balustrades goes round and round inside the funnel. Conditions are good on Mr. Anassis's yacht. On the, the ship had a lot of the very unusual things. One was that every uh, cabin was named after a Greek island and had a map of that island on the door uh, uh, in, in gold, about like a quarter of an inch thick in gold. On board the yacht, the bathrooms are in marbles of many colours. Some have taps that are gilded dolphins. Mr. Anassis has made a fortune of anywhere between 100 and 200 million pounds. And he had this bar with uh, stools round, which were uh, lovely to look at and wonderfully soft. And uh, he used to sit you on that and say, uh, now think, uh, think you are the most beautiful woman in the world. And do you know you are now nearest to the most beautiful and powerful penis in the world? And he said, and then they kind of go back and say, Mr. Onassis. And he said, no, no, I'm not speaking of myself. I am speaking of the stools. They're all made from the penis of the giant um, white whale. And, uh, and, it's, and if I don't know whether they were or not, but there was certainly there were a wonderful leather that I'd never come across in my life before or since. The soft white leather that sheathed the bar stools came, in fact, from the foreskins of sperm whales. Commercial whaling was an indispensable source of hard cash for the Anassis Empire. Anassis was a person who was single-minded in getting what he wanted, and he saw that the restrictions on whaling imposed by the International Whaling Commission would prevent him making as much money as he wanted, so he just went outside the law altogether. Anassis had absolute disregard for, for any kind of rule. The whales that he took were any kind that came in front of his boats. If they were whales that were supposed to be protected because they were smaller than the legal minimum size, it made no difference. For example, when he was whaling off the coast of Peru, it was uh, worked out that something like 96% of the sperm whales he took were undersized. This terrible damage to whale stocks did not concern Onassis. He once said, the rules are, there are no rules. To evade quotas, he registered his whale catchers in Panama, which had not signed the whaling treaty. I went down and went into the office in Monte Carlo. Then he said, now, tell me, what do the British people really think about me, the top people in the oil business and these sort of things? And I said, you really want to know, Mr. Nassis? And he said, yes. I said, well, I'll tell you. He said, one minute. Nigel, you are my guest in Monte Carlo. I don't want you to be embarrassed. First of all, I'll tell you what they think about me. So I said, well, that'll be a big relief, Mr. Nassis. Yes, you tell me. He said, they think I'm a Greek shit with too much money, don't they? <laughs> and roared with laughter. And I said, you're absolutely right. He had a luxury yacht, a fleet of tankers, and enormous wealth. And yet he remained at heart, the refugee from Smyrna. He said, I'm no point in being a rich man unless you can hang on to your money. I am a rich man everywhere. I have a million pounds in every different area of the world. And you know, South America, Southeast Asia, North America, and the yacht, said, was always fueled and ready uh, to go. If anything happened, we'd go straight off and out uh, of the Mediterranean. When he decided which place he was going to go to, where he had a million in gold hidden away. And I said, well, but um, what are you going to do? You get there, I mean, if this is going to happen, I mean, there may be revolutions and things going. And he said, well, I have my own army. He said, they're all trained um, fighting men, the crew. The uh, captain is the highest decorated German U-boat commander in the war. And he took me along, and there was one of the corridors running down the, the centre of the ship. And he pressed a button, and the th uh, panel went back. And there were all these, uh, the latest sort of submachine guns and uh, rocket launchers and God knows what. Even on his yacht, Onassis never stopped thinking about the next deal. 
many times uh, at the end of a day or at the end of a party or a nice dinner or whatever, when everybody else was gone to bed. And he was putting on a coat, he was going at the stern of the Christina, taking a, a whiskey and sitting alone there thinking for maybe two or three hours by himself, just thinking about his business, I presume, and his plans. In 1953, Onassis devised a plan so audacious that it threatened to turn the multinational oil industry on its head. He found out that he was in conflict with the policy of the oil companies, the major oil companies, the Seven Sisters. Because they would build their own ships and they would only charter uh, independent uh, carriers from time to time. Uh, as he wrote once in a letter, he felt like a taxi driver who saw that all his customers would buy their own cars. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, uh, he wanted a piece of the cake. Ever since the Americans struck oil in Saudi Arabia, Aramco, the great consortium of American petroleum companies, controlled everything from drilling to refining. Onassis took an offer to the new and inexperienced king. He asked the king to let him ship an ever-increasing share of Saudi crude. In return, he promised to build a fleet of oil tankers flying the Saudi flag. The Jeddah deal would have enabled him to dictate world freight rates for oil. Had the deal of uh, Jeddah been successful for Onassis, he would have become the richest man in the world. Because there was no limit for his profits, because he would get more and more percentages from the Saudi Arabian government. It was actually a threat to the other governments and a threat to the other ship owners. There was a secret meeting in London after the news leaked out. Onassis's great rival, Stavros Niakos, had hired someone to scuttle the Jeddah deal. The man he met at Claridge's hotel was a high-level fixer and troubleshooter. This is the first time that Robert Amy Mayhew has told his full story on television. They detested each other. There's no doubt that the personal element was, was what enhanced the, the enthusiasm to kill. But it was survival. No, he f truly felt threatened from a business point of view. The first thing you know, if you allow this to continue, there is no market for any competitor. As a former FBI agent, Mayhew was able to place a bug on Onassis because he convinced the intelligence community that the Jeddah deal was a threat to US national security. It had just happened that uh, a week before I was hired by Niakos, uh, CIA had placed me in a monthly retainer to handle uh, sensitive assignments for them. As a consequence, now we really had a built-in ally. They made the communication system available to me throughout the world. And we made life for Mr. Nia uh, for Mr. Onassis more difficult. To put it mildly. To put it mildly. Mayhew activated his political contacts in Washington. He started at the top. Uh, what happened is that uh, uh, we were able to uh, have an appointment with the Vice President of the United States. Mr. Nixon was Vice President at the time, and he immediately recognized that this is something that should be immediately presented to the National Security Council. After uh, thanking him and on the way out he said if you have to kill this son of a bitch don't do it on American shores Mayhew struck his next blow at a shipyard in Germany well the the first super tanker that was being built specifically for this for this deal uh, was at Hamburg and it was to be named after the king the, the then king and we realized that uh, we could never 
stop the agreement if that first shipment was allowed to take place. And as a consequence, uh, in a fight for time, we managed to organize a strike at the shipyard in Hamburg. So you organized, who organized it? Uh, I, I did uh, through uh, some of my operators and uh, also with the help of CIA. Despite everything, Onassis finished his ship. He even invited American oil executives to attend her launch. Onassis knew that if they refused his invitation, it would be an insult to the Saudi king, after whom the ship was named. Mayhew devised a new means of attack. We felt quite sure that uh, his financial structure was very, very weak, and that if we could cause him a major problem, that his whole house of cards would collapse. We knew that uh, his fleet uh, had the experience of fishing in illegal waters off Peru. As a consequence, we made arrangements with the Peru Peruvian government to seize his fleet. They sent out ships, they sent out an aircraft which actually bombed around the factory ship. They certainly strafed it with machine gun fire and uh, they forced the boat back into harbor with the catchers. And the Peruvians were very nasty about it. They said, you're going to pay a huge fine. We want $3 million to let you go again. And uh, the night that that happened, uh, we had a big banquet thinking that we now had killed the monster. Much to our amazement, we soon learned that he had this whole thing booked with, House, uh, with uh, Lloyds of London, if you please, including his potential profit. He got uh, $15 million in insurance money and $30,000 a day for all the time that he was out of the whaling operation. I mean, he just made an enormous amount of money out of it. So he was just laughing all the way to the bank came out richer than before without having to, to work as hard. In the end, a Swiss court ruled in favor of the big oil companies. Onassis had to back off the Jeddah deal. By then, big oil had almost brought him to his knees. The American oil companies are not the no angels. They're far more unscrupulous than any Greek ship whatever it was. They went after him. Why would they why would they allow our Nazis to make all the profits with the Arabs when they were doing it themselves? They had ships too, and they were afraid that our Nazis might up the freights of the ships when they were carrying their oil, which was coming to them. Well, they all ganged together uh, in a concerted effort to frustrate the, the deal. Uh, politically, financially, and, uh, and, and otherwise. First of all, they would not charter the ships. The Donas' uh, fleet was boycotted. Secondly, they would look into the charter parties which were in existence for loopholes in order to frustrate and jeopardize the deal. And uh, also by protesting to the Saudi government and doing a big fuss. So this was uh, a very bad situation for Onassis and his fleet because suddenly he was obliged to lay up the highest um, number of his fleet. As his rivals snapped up the charter contracts he had lost, Onassis began talking to his bankers. Then help came from an unexpected quarter. Riding a new crest of popularity is President Gamal Abdel Nasser, Egypt's clever, ambitious strongman. In Suez, he has created a crisis and an emotional weapon to stir the passions of 23 million Egyptians. Gamal Abdel Nasser had nationalized the Suez Canal, the vital waterway for the world's oil tankers. Believing their national interests were at stake, Britain and France went to war. Cairo fell swiftly. Egypt's army was defeated, but the West paid a price. 
sunken ships blocked the canal, so Middle Eastern oil had to travel round the Cape twice as far. Twice as many oil tankers were now needed. Only one man had a fleet of ships with not enough to do, and he was Aristotle Onassis. When the Suez Canal closed down, we had uh, a 65,000 ton tanker which made one trip from Persian Gulf to UK or Northern Europe and earned six and a half million dollars. It had only cost four million dollars to build the ship. Freight rates shot up more than a thousand percent and within six months he was 80 million dollars richer. In business terms, he never looked back. He knew how to weather the storms of economic boom and bust. His fleet made money when there were wars in the Middle East and rode out the oil embargoes of the 70s. To the very end, he was never to lose his flair for business. Outwardly, his family life seemed ideal. His wife Tina was a celebrated society beauty. Christian Dior made doll's clothes for his daughter Christina. She and her brother Alexander had everything they wanted, except for one thing, the company of their father. I mean, they had the most tremendous pre toys. I mean, I remember Alexander had uh, a small racing car and everybody, including Anassas, had to be careful because it might come out of nowhere roaring at you and you had to jump into the shrubbery. Alexander had something like 25 suits. He sort of opened a thing. This is a small boy with all these beautiful uh, uh, suits made for him. And as with many rich people, the, uh, for every present you get, you know, your father's away for another two days. As for his mother of his children, he loved her, but she was unfit to be Onassis's wife. Tina was too busy with herself than with her family. She never had the time for her children. She was frivolous. She was a butterfly. His uh, relationship with Tina was rather hard to work out. And I couldn't sleep one night, so I came down very quietly. Uh, and as I just passed the first floor, the doors were flung open and I saw, I didn't see them, but I could see their shadows on the wall, like, as, as if on a, on a screen, and a shadow play of some kind. And I was looking there and there was fearful row going on in, uh, uh, in Greek. Uh, and then suddenly I saw on the, uh, on, in the shadow, uh, the, the, the small, I think he was slightly smaller than she was, uh, but drew back a fist and hit her. Oh! And so she made this, this noise. So I started to go down and I went round the next thing and I could look again and saw the, the, sh the shadow. And the shadow had changed from the woman going back and, and the fist. Uh, and they were clasped together and, uh, and uh, the voices were saying what obviously in Greek was, my darling, my darling, I love you. And uh, they, they melded together and they closed the doors and went in. So uh, I don't know, by some standards, you could say that was a happy marriage. There was, however, another woman. <laughs> Maria Callas was the most famous diva in the world. And the pulling power of this one woman on this stage definitely fascinated her. Well, first of all, he devised the idea, obviously, of saying to his wife, let's invite the Callas and her husband, Meneghini, um, on the Christina, because she tried to resist going. And the husband sort of said, well, you do need a break. And uh, that seduced her into it. Onassis never has been connected with art because you know that he had some very bad experience about the collecting paintings. Therefore, collecting 
some people like colors, it was much more important than having some paintings of good masters. Onassis had always cultivated the company of celebrities, like Sir Winston Churchill. But Maria Callas was something different. He was definitely drawn by La Callas, but the person he seduced was Maria, the woman. Then what did she see in Onassis? Well, when Greek meets Greek, boomf, you know. It was a bit too much. I mean, he brought the mistress right on the boat, which is par for a Greek marriage. I, I wouldn't, didn't shock me at all. It didn't shock my father. Um, uh, and my father did it all his life, that. But my mother wasn't Tina. Tina took umbrage and she left. Onassis and Callas, the two most famous Greeks in the world, were for a time the two most famous lovers in the world. Tina's second husband was Sonny Blanford, the future Duke of Marlborough. Then, after her sister died, she became the fourth, Mrs. Stavros Niarchos. Legal difficulties prevented Callas getting a divorce. When they were removed, Onassis seemed delighted. So I said, we were kidding. I said, uh, well, you have become a signorina now. <laughs> you won't be signora, you be signorina. <laughs> that took care of the whole problem. Though she was finally free to marry, Onassis kept her waiting in the wings. They had an argument, some sort of silly argument, and she left and went back to Paris. Well, I don't know about a woman scorned, but a man walked out on, turned the tables on her, and uh, he sets his eyes on a form of revenge, really, in, in wooing Mrs. Kennedy. This uh, concern uh, to manage always to be with a lady who was, uh, who added something to him, perhaps is the only humility he has had in his life. When he invited her to Scorpius, rumors began to fly and paparazzi began to swarm. It was, it was just a rumor uh, and it wasn't anything close to, to news. But we knew that um, Jackie and Ted Kennedy were invited on uh, an SS yacht at Scorpios, and that a Buzuki group with a friend of mine, a singer called Yanis Poulopoulos, was invited to entertain the guests at the time. So I thought I would force my way into the group, uh, pretend to be a guitar player, which I wasn't, put a Minox camera behind the cords of the guitar and hope to a scoop. Well, Jackie loved the party. I mean, she was ecstatic with the, with the music. So when the music started to play and the people started to sing, she got up and she wanted to dance. And she attempted to throw a plate on the floor and she picked the most expensive dinner plate. Onassis grabbed it in me there, called Dionysi, who was in charge of entertainment, said, bring the cheap plates out, Dionysi. <laughs> and she kept breaking plates all night long. It was about four o'clock in the morning and Jackie was long gone. Nassis had been drinking with the group and uh, singing songs with the group. And then he looked at his watch and he said, fellas, I'll have to say good night. Got to go down and take care of my wife. And that was, I was the exact quote that I was expecting from him because I knew from his friends that he was referring to Jackie as his wife and the whole thing had been arranged. He so saw in him a guy who knew how to enjoy life, how to spend his money really for that purpose. Uh, Nassis was, as I said, bigger than life. He was a contemporary Zorba the Greek. So it wasn't difficult to love him, and it wasn't difficult for Jackie to fall in love with the idea that she would be Mrs. Onassis. The proposal of Mr. A.S. Onassis... Marrying the widow of a Democratic president put Onassis under the spotlight. He was working on a massive deal with the military junta, which had imposed fascism on Greece. Ever since Smyrna, he'd been cynical about all governments and had no patience with political questions from the press. What the hell that has to do with what we are doing here, will you tell me? Now, don't start this because I'm going. I think ever since he married Jackie, everything turned bad for him. The Greeks are very superstitious people, and a lot of them said she was the Black Widow, and I thought it was rather unfair, but I'm very superstitious myself. I certainly wouldn't want to have been in Ronassa's shoes. Cracks began to show in the marriage, 
Onassis was horrified by Jackie's extravagance. She was spending more than her monthly allowance of $30,000 on clothes. Preparing the ground for a possible divorce, he actually leaked her shopping bills to an investigative reporter. It was a perfect marriage, joked his children. He loves names, and Jackie loves money. He was a loving father, but a domineering one, who broke up Christina's first imprudent marriage. He disapproved of Alexander's love affair with an older woman. But despite this, father and son were growing closer. He was adoring Alexander. He was not loving Alexander. He was adoring Alexander, but in his own way. What brought them together was flying, Onassis owned Olympic Airways. He was the only private individual to own a national carrier. He called it his hobby, but to Alexander, flying was a vocation. Alexander was a brilliant young man, and I don't have any hesitation to say that he was born to be a pilot. He was flying amphibian aeroplanes, jets, and helicopters as well. Alexander was scheduled to check out a new pilot on a January afternoon in 1973. The plane had just been serviced, and he was not to know that the aileron connecting cables had somehow been reversed. On takeoff, the pilot tried to turn left. The harder he tried, the more violently the plane banked to the right. Alexander was uh, very badly injured in his head. Only his heart was working. His brain was not functioning. This was proved right from the first day. Of course, we advised his father, also his mother. Now they said, is he going to live? And they said, yes, he'll live, but he won't uh, think uh, or be able to speak again, probably. And Daddy said, I won't have anything of it. I won't have anything of it. He must die. He was in oxygen for uh, 24 hours. And then uh, Onassis gave his consent to cut the oxygen. It was days before Onassis could bring himself to bury his son. They brought Alexander to the little chapel on Scorpius. Onassis often came here. He was frequently seen sitting by his son's grave for three and four hours at a time. Tell me, sir, how you feel at this point. Well, like any other human being, I'm not anything special or exceptional. Like any father would feel. He's a nice boy. He was a promising boy and a good boy. Aristo had died after his son had died, period. I mean, he was a living corpse, so I would say. Up with him, Paul. It was really, I think, the biggest shock that he had during his life time. It upset him very much. And, of course, later on, this awful disease, I don't know what it was that he had, and I was sitting at lunch with him one day at Claridge's, and he said, uh, oh, Nigel, you've noticed my eyes, I think. And apparently he had to sort of stick his eyelids up to keep them open. Onassis knew he was dying when he entered hospital in Paris. His disease, myasthenia gravis, was incurable. While Jackie visited frequently, his daughter Christina hardly left his side. Jackie was with her own children in New York on March the 15th, 1975, the night he died. He had not wanted to come to the hospital. His wife and daughter had to persuade him. It was almost as if he had wished to die. His body was flown home to Greece. It was
was on a long flight some months earlier, but he had written his will. In it, he left half his estate to his daughter, Christina. Jackie's inheritance was limited by a prenuptial agreement. She was eventually to get $26 million. Christina had always loved her father too much and never found a man to replace him. After four marriages and many failed relationships, her heart weakened by diet pills, she died aged 37. Onassis's funeral cortege passed through the little fishing village of Glyfada. The coffin had been made from one of the walnut trees that grew on his island. For the second time in this story, a flotilla of small boats crosses the water to Scorpios. Before he died, he established the Alexander Onassis Foundation in memory of his son. Each year, it distributes millions of dollars to charity, medical research, the arts, and good causes. And so the Onassis name lives on. For unlike other reputations, business fame rarely lasts long. In the Greek Orthodox religion, only saints can be buried inside a church. But Anassis found a way around that. Annexes have been built on each side of the chapel. And today they enclose the tombs of his son, his daughter, and himself. The Christina was donated to the Greek government. But for years she has been left to rust in a naval dockyard. There are not many people left, it seems, who can afford a yacht that burns 30 tons of oil a day. Good. 